Hey guys, this is Jared, uh, your substitute teaching leader. Uh, I'm so happy to be with you guys this week and give you guys a lecture on John chapter 3. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to share uh, one announcement is that we still have openings for two leadership positions uh, for our class here in Tucson. Um, first being an admin lead and the second still being a children's leader. Um, both of these would be serving on Monday evenings at the Journey Church at the base class. Uh, but by no means does that uh, disqualify you if you currently attend one of the satellite groups. If you feel the Lord is uh, placing it on your heart to, to serve our class here in Tucson, please reach out to Eric or Brian, our admin lead, or uh, myself. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the lecture for this week. Fall is in full swing, and that means playoff baseball. And surprisingly, the Diamondbacks are making some noise this year. So hopefully they go pretty far. But there is a reason why baseball is still called America's pastime. We love the fact that baseball has been around since the 19th century. We love the drama. We love the passion. We love the uniqueness of the one-on-one -on -one duels between pitchers and hitters within the team versus team competition. We love the multiple layers of strategy on both sides of the ball. One of the, quote, relatively newer strategies that's really developed over the past two decades is specifically that of the closer. Pitchers that perform at an elite level and are and excel at converting outs and minimizing runs allowed that make careers out of pitching only in the last inning. You had a couple athletes over the past 40 years that would be used in a role similar to this, but it wasn't until the early 2000s where this idea of a closing pitcher really got popular across the league as a whole. The logic is that if the winning team has a very narrow lead, they'll send in their closer in the most critical part of the game to maximize their chance of holding off a late game rally and finishing with a win. Baseball managers place enormous responsibility on these closing pitchers. A good closer is a solid anchor for any team, especially if that team has postseason aspirations. Closers only enter the game under very specific circumstances and for very specific purposes. Our study of John this year spans a unique time in human history, the time when God deemed it critical that his closer enter the game and secure the eternal win. Jesus came down from heaven to dwell among us on earth for a specific purpose. Our study of chapter 3 this week takes us deeply into what this purpose is. So our study of John Chapter 3 this week will have two divisions. New life in Jesus, which will be John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And testimony about Jesus. And that will be John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. So go ahead and get your Bibles out as we start to dig into our scripture. By this point, Jesus' earthly ministry is well underway, and people are starting to take notice. Jesus has called several disciples to himself, and he's performed his first miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding celebration. He's also cleared out the moneylenders from the temple and performed other signs while in Jerusalem, which John tells us that many people saw. The name of Jesus was beginning to circulate, and the Pharisees 
or beginning to take notice. These are the same men who took an interest in John the Baptist and his baptizing practices back in John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. They are the Jewish religious leaders charged with teaching the law to the populace and as well as ensuring obedience to said law. But to be clear, over time, the Pharisees have added other rules and regulations to the law, some of which was not truly grounded in God's word. Obeying the rules for rules' sake had crept into their doctrine and warped the purpose away from obeying and honoring God. They defined and maintained the religious status quo. John the Baptist and now Jesus and their teachings are going against their grain. And those of you who are already familiar with the Bible know that it, it is the increasing opposition and hostility from these religious leaders that ultimately shape Jesus' path to the cross. Next week's lesson will cover the first time the Pharisees publicly opposed Jesus' ministry. But this week, we start with a unique interaction. A member of these Pharisees, Nicodemus, is being drawn to Jesus. Despite his prominent position and social status, he recognized that there was something about Jesus that was different than what he had. His understanding of scriptures is enough to recognize that Jesus must have a relationship with God by the miracles he's performing. So in his curiosity, Nicodemus chose to come to Jesus personally and ask some questions. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. There may have been an element of secrecy as to why Nicodemus approached Jesus at night, but one commentator also suggested that having this discussion at night would mean no crowds around Jesus, and it would be done in cooler temperatures. Both conditions ideal for having an intentional and long discussion. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. The beauty of Jesus' teaching is that he tends to talk and teach in parables and illustrations. He would use human context and understanding as a pretense for vibrant, divine, and heavenly truth and glory. It is the case here with Nicodemus, and it's the case for you and I as we read his words 2,000 years later. But Nicodemus was myopically focused on the earthly implications of Jesus' words. They are confusing. If I removed the context of Jesus' statements and came to you and said, you need to be born again, you would also be confused. But what a blessing it is that Jesus desires for us to understand him. He pursues us and meets us at our current understanding. Jesus patiently and lovingly continues to reveal truth to Nicodemus. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. 
so it is with everyone born in the Spirit. Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus was part of unfolding his salvation story to the world. Since the beginning of creation in Genesis chapter 3, humanity has been plagued by the brokenness of sin. Each and every single person throughout history has inherited Adam and Eve's sinful nature. You and I have inherited their sinful nature. God removed Adam and Eve from the garden because the absolute holiness and pure righteousness of his character cannot abide sin. God's just nature requires a penalty to be paid for the sins that we have committed. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 succinctly tells us that the wages of sin is death. Our sin nature puts us in direct conflict with our holy creator God. Our sin nature condemns us to physical death and will continue to keep us separated from God for all eternity. It condemns us also to spiritual death. There is nothing that we can do, nothing that we can offer, nothing that we can provide that is of equivalent value to the cost that our sinful nature condemns us to owe. But God has made a way to himself for us through his son, through Jesus. Jesus' purpose for coming down from heaven and to earth was to provide a way for you and I to be reconciled back to God. Jesus came to take our place, to bear the punishment that we deserve, and to suffer the death that we are condemned to. On the cross, Jesus' one death rooted in the nature of his humanity, paid the penalty for an infinite number of sins, for an infinite number of people, valid over an infinite span of time because of his nature as divine infiniteness, because of his deity. Jesus' death in our place provides us the only way back into relationship with God the Father, a way to spend eternity with him in his presence, a spiritual new birth. This new birth of salvation is what Jesus was speaking of with Nicodemus. Responding by saying, I tell you the truth, Jesus was emphasizing the importance of his next words. To be born of water is to be cleansed of our sin through faith in Jesus and the work he performed to pay the penalty for our sin. In next week's lesson, Jesus will teach us about the living water he offers. Water often represents the cleansing, life-giving power of God's word. The first chapter of this gospel refers to Jesus as the word. Through faith in the word, faith in Jesus, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, God himself who dwells within us. At the same time, we are sealed so that we will be in God's presence for eternity. Through this gracious gift of faith, we are eternally secure in and through Jesus. This is what it means to be born again, to be made new today and to live in glory with God forever. Knowing Nicodemus is stuck in his worldly understanding, Jesus continues to invite him into something higher and something beyond what he was currently seeing. Jesus, through admonition of Nic Nicodemus, who is, knowledge who is knowledgeable of Scripture, is for Nicodemus joining himself to the fulfillment of prophecy from the prophets in the Old Testament that point to the coming Messiah. 
Coming to faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus, the Holy Spirit was slowly opening Nicodemus to the reality of the Word of God. Faith is a gift and the work of God that a person is moved to accept. We do not and cannot control the Spirit, that each person has a responsibility to choose whether to accept the invitation of faith in Christ Jesus. If we choose to reject him, we take full responsibility for our sin and will bear its punishment of eternal death and separation from God. The only way out is to put our faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ. We believe that he is the Messiah. We believe that he bore the full weight of our sins and took on judgment that we deserve. We believe that he rose from the dead. We believe that we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit who shows us what the Father desires and what he is doing. We believe we will rise with him into new, glorious, and eternal life when our physical life on earth is over. In faith and with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we know where we are going with Jesus forever. And at this point, all Nicodemus can do is ask a simple question. How can this be? You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you out of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Part of the problem is that the Pharisees who are charged with teaching the scripture to Israel are they themselves ignorant of its ultimate purpose to point them to the coming Messiah, to point them to Jesus as he stands before them? Throughout the Gospels, Jesus would proclaim that he only did what he saw the Father doing. Our study of John chapter 1 showed us that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were working together during creation. Jesus very clearly is revealing to Nicodemus that he has the authority to speak on heavenly things because he himself is heavenly in origin. In other words, Jesus knows heavenly and godly things because he himself is God. As mentioned earlier, God the Father's plan of salvation through Jesus is only possible because Jesus is equally part of the triune Godhead as the Son. There can be den no denying that Jesus' entire earthly ministry was built on the foundation that Jesus was God and that Jesus declared his divine and eternal sonship with God. Jesus even reveals to Nicodemus through scripture that he would be familiar with, that the Son of Man will be lifted up, just as Moses lifted the snake in the desert. In both cases, God made a way for his people who were suffering to be saved from the punishment of death for their sin. In Moses' time, those bit by the snakes could look upon the bronze snake and not succumb to the snake bites. They would be spared from physical death. But all people who look upon and believe in Jesus as he is lifted up on the cross will be eternally spared from their spiritual death.
But as we get to verses 16 through 21, there is a shift. In the original Greek text, there are no quotation marks here. So it's up to the translations to attribute these verses to Jesus, which some do, and others to John, the author of the gospel. So I'm going to cover this section of scripture um, as another exposition of John, uh, which he would often do in this gospel, is take a thought of Jesus and then flush it out for us even more. And then also an, some other evidence for this being John's exposition is the tense change that uh, takes place here in the wording. But either case, these verses concretely affirm what we've already discussed. Jesus came to offer eternal life. So let's read through verse 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. By giving us his Son, God expressed the most perfect form of love that we can experience. So one commentator broke down verse 16 specifically like this. God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree of love, the whole world, the greatest company, that he gave the greatest act, his one and only son, the greatest gift, that whoever, the greatest opportunity for all people, believes in him, the greatest simplicity, shall not perish, which is the greatest promise, but the greatest difference, have the greatest certainty, eternal life, the greatest possession. This is why this verse shows up across the country at sporting events. Everyone knows this verse, but it's because of the absolute power of this verse that it is as popular as it is. What a blessing. As scripture continues, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done was done through God. Jesus gives all of humanity a black and white choice. Using John's words, it's a verdict. Guilt in our sin or innocence in Jesus. We do not deserve it. Nothing we can do on our own will ever make us worthy of deserving it. Yet, God offers it freely. All we need to do is choose to believe. This is salvation in Jesus Christ. The only thing we deserve is death, but Jesus took that on for us. Through his death, God's justice is satisfied and through Jesus' resurrection, God mercifully imputes Jesus' righteousness onto believers. Believers stand justified before God. When God looks at believers, all he sees is the cleansing, purifying work of Christ. The balance has been paid in full. Through his light, believers are plucked from the eternal darkness that is the fate of those who choose to reject Jesus. And that brings us to our principle for our first division. Jesus' purpose is to save people for eternity. Again, Jesus' purpose is to save people for eternity. As we will see in the rest of our study of John this year, 
Jesus came with urgency and purpose. He came to provide a way from condemnation for those he loves. So how does your understanding of what Jesus has done for you cause you to respond? Will you put your faith in him? For those of you who already belong to him, in what areas of your life might you be trying to earn God's favor instead of humbly turning it over and finding freedom in the peace that Jesus offers? How will you seek to fully live out new life in Jesus Christ? As we move on to the rest of chapter 3, the scene is going to shift to John the Baptist, but the focus is going to remain on the imminent saving works of Jesus Christ. Since baptizing and revealing Jesus as the Lamb of God, as well as foreshadowing the baptism of the Holy Spirit to come, John the Baptist has continued to baptize people as a form of repentance. However, more and more people are gathering to Jesus now to be baptized instead of John. And some of John's disciples are concerned. Starting in verse 26, they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. Just as Nicodemus had a worldly focused view of the words that Jesus was sharing with him, John the Baptist's disciples had a worldly focused view of the current events. But John, filled with the Holy Spirit, however, did not share their concern. He understood that he was not meant to direct people to himself, but to the one who could save. John's role in God's kingdom was the forerunner for Christ. Just as the prophets had before him, he declared and made a way for the Messiah's coming. His place was not to think less of himself, but rather to think more of Jesus. To this, John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. Scripture refers to Jesus as the bridegroom and the church, us believers, as his radiant bride. It's beautiful imagery and why marriage today is to reflect the Lord's relationship with the church. How appropriate then for John the Baptist to consider himself the friend of the bridegroom, standing with Jesus, but not the central figure. Looking at verse 31, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. Jesus' rightful place is as the central figure in everything, in creation, in the redemptive plan of salvation, and in the lives of you and I. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, who draws believers to Jesus Christ, and through his Spirit, from the lips of Jesus and from the lips of those who believe in him, they testify that everything about him is true. Verses 33 and 34 say that whoever has accepted it, meaning the truth about Jesus, has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Holy Spirit spoke through John the Baptist. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would begin to dwell on believers in, in mass at Pentecost after Jesus' death 
resurrection, and ascension. And the Holy Spirit is alive and active today, drawing people to Jesus, becoming a part of them, and being his witness through believers to the world. If we needed any more proof for who Jesus says he is, here is John the Baptist, through the same Holy Spirit, affirming for us what Jesus had just said about himself. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. How critically important it is for the world to understand their need for Jesus to be central in their lives. And that brings us to the principle for this division. A Christian's highest purpose is to turn people's attention to Jesus. Again, a Christian's highest purpose is to turn people's attention to Jesus. As the author of our salvation, he alone is worthy of our wholehearted commitment and focus. As believers, God has given us the unique, humble privilege of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Who is someone that you know that needs to hear the truth about Jesus? What sin, pride, or envy in your life might stand in the way of the integrity of your witness? Now, how in your life are you pointing others to him? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the salvation that can be found in your Son. Thank you for loving us enough to send him to die in our place and then to be resurrected and glorified at your right hand so that we may have confidence in our eternal relationship with you. Lord, I just pray that you help us magnify Jesus. Lord, make yourself known to the people who need you need a relationship with you through your son's sacrifice. Thank you again for loving each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.